Greetings all, Ferrari Man 601 here. Welcome back to another 118th scale model car review of this, the 1976 Tyrrell P34, rendered in 118th scale by True Scale Miniatures. This model is one that you have seen before. Many years back, I did one of my old style reviews of this very model. However, I thought that it was high time to take a better look at it now that we have got some better cameras and some better ways in order to show this to you. So here we are, the Tyrrell P34. It is one of the most legendary Formula One cars ever to be produced and ever to win a Grand Prix. Yes, it is. The famed six-wheeler is the only six-wheeler that ever saw action in anger, and it's the only six-wheeler, therefore, that ever won a Grand Prix. The 19th 76 Swedish Grand Prix was won by this car. Fielded by Tyrrell in 1976 and 1977, it was designed chiefly by Derek Gardner, who was Tyrrell's chief designer of the time. It was a radical departure from anything else the world had ever seen at this point. As we'll get into later on, the six wheels on this car were a response to an aerodynamic problem, and the 1970s being the era of experimentation, it was an era in which anything was deemed legal and possible as far as Formula One design was concerned. Gerald decided, hey, let's try something a little bit radical, and it had some teething problems, some reliability issues, but eventually it all came good, and it did culminate in that Grand Prix victory in Sweden. The rest of the car, though, as we will see, is rather conventional given the era in which it was designed and the era in which it was raised. But because it is such a radical departure from the rest of Formula One and open wheeler in general design of that period, it is still one that is remembered today, not really because of its competition history. Of course, no championships and no race wins other than that single triumph in Sweden for this car. It is remembered for its radical design, and a couple of these are still in running condition to this day, one of which I do believe is even owned by Jody Schechter, the driver shown here, having driven this car in anger in 1976. This is a really cool model. It's one that we haven't seen for many years, and the detail and features on it definitely are worthy of a rather extensive look at it. So sit back, relax, and I hope that you all enjoy this look at the 1976 Terrell P34. Let's get started. The reason for this car to exist at all is not because Formula One cars of the mid-70s had any deficit in mechanical grip. No. Rather, it is due to a trend that is far more familiar to the modern Formula One fan, and that is one of aerodynamics. This is the mid-1970s. By this point, we had flown to the moon, we had a supersonic passenger airliner in the form of Concorde, and we had, of course, very sophisticated racing cars such as this one. Aerodynamics had transitioned from being the black art that it had been basically from the dawn of the automotive age all the way through the 1960s, and now designers had a very good understanding of how aerodynamics influenced the behavior of a race car. Due to this, there was a problem with the Formula One technical regulations in this era. In so many words, the technical regulations stipulated that the maximum width of a front wing was one and a half meters. The track of a car, though, could exceed one and a half meters. And when you factored that in with the width of a tire, it became apparent that the front wheels on a Formula One car were going to be outside the bounds of the front wing. Now, this is something that we see Today, it's something that we saw all the way through the 80s, all the way through the 90s, and the early part of the 2000s. Only now are the front wings pretty much the same width as the front track on the cars, but you also still have to account for the width of the tires. So even now, we see the tires outside of the boundaries of the front wing. However, in the 70s, this was also the era of experimentation. Therefore, teams experimented quite frequently. The result of all of that experimentation for Terrell was this. Wanting to keep an aerodynamic advantage in terms of maintaining a low frontal area on this car. Low frontal area meaning a small cross-sectional area when viewed from the front presented to the onrushing airstream. The narrower a projectile you have going through the air, the less drag it's going to generate. And the less drag you generate, that means the more that you can take advantage of the engine power that you're generating, and the more that you can manipulate airflow to do other things for you. Therefore, Tyrrell decided, alright, 
if we can fit smaller wheels to the front of our car, we can keep them inside that one and a half meter boundary of the front wing, and therefore we can cut down on a whole lot of drag. So that's what Terrell initially set out to do with Derek Gardner, their chief designer. Unfortunately, when they did the math, they realized that the only size of wheel and tire that would fit inside that one and a half meter boundary would be a 10 inch diameter tire. And this, of course, is far too small, particularly when we look at the tread area on that tire and the contact patch that's actually touching the road. 10 inches in diameter, no, that's not going to present nearly enough rubber on the ground to give you sufficient grip. So what do we do about this? Well, let's just add two more wheels on the front, and that is why this car has four wheels up front and two at the back for a grand total of six. Of course, those of you who know your Formula One history, you know all about this car, why it existed, and why it does have its rather radical appearance, but for the relative layman, that is the long and short of why it was done. It was an aerodynamic solution, not a mechanical grip solution. The car also happened to enjoy some pretty remarkable mechanical grip because it had all that rubber down on the front end. And you might also think that it would be difficult to drive a car like this because of all of that mass up front. But no, the steering system was really well thought out and it was very smooth by uh, all accounts that I've been able to find. Of course, no power assist on Formula One cars or basically any racing car in this era, but the uh, steering was very smooth from what I've been able to gather and uh, very non-reactive as well. Of course, the other technical considerations that you have to come into uh, consider here with having four wheels up front is the suspension design and of course your steering rack geometries there, but you also have to think about your brakes. All six wheels have brakes on them, all four wheels up front have discs inside the wheel hub as you would expect even on a road car today. And all of that needs to be synchronized and it needs to have the proper plumbing and you need the brake master cylinders and you need to make sure you've got good hydraulic pressure up there to actuate the braking action on these cars and well, all of that had to happen and all of that did happen and it happened to great effect really uh, by the time that this concept was out on the track. The only other issues, though, that you would have uh, if you're going to be driving this car, you'd run into the idea of because you've got four wheels up front and because most of the weight on this car is still near the rear axle, because obviously you've got your engine back there, if you locked one set of front wheels but the other set remained in motion, you effectively change the wheelbase of the car momentarily, which could make it react very violently and very unexpectedly to your inputs, which otherwise would have been entirely normal and the car would have no problem with at all. So there was a bit of a learning curve for the drivers in this era, the guys who were crazy enough to strap into a car like this, which was basically completely new and untested technology, but it worked out at least for a little while for Terrell. Overall technical specifications on this car. The chassis is an aluminum monocoque, no carbon fiber yet in the automotive world. It did exist in aerospace applications, but all aluminum here put together with rivets and welds. Very interesting. Suspension on the front. It's a double wishbone suspension with coil springs over dampers, you know, struts, and uh, anti-roll bars. That was actuating the suspension on all four front wheels. The rear suspension was a double wishbone arrangement with radius arms, coil springs, over strut dampers, and an anti-roll bar. So something that's still rather conventional when we talk about road cars. Again, the dimensions on this thing. Here's where it gets interesting. Axle track, so that is the width of the axles with the tires. On the front, it's 1,234 millimeters or 48.6 inches. So that's quite narrow and it's just barely out, uh, it's actually inside the one and a half meter boundary of that front wing. At the rear though, much wider, 1,473 millimeters or 58 inches exactly. So you can see just how much wider this car is at the rear than it is at the front. That's quite intentional and that's exactly why they went for the four front wheels. Overall wheelbase, that's the length between the frontmost front axle and the rear axle. That's 2,453 millimeters or 96.6 inches. The engine in the car. Yes, it is the legendary Ford Cosworth DFV. It's 2,993 cc's, just underneath 
three liters displacement. That's 182.6 cubic inches in old money. It's a 90 degree bank angle. It's of course a V8 naturally aspirated and on this car as it was in most of the Formula One cars that use this basically spec customer engine in the mid 70s, it is mid mounted and it is longitudinally mounted. The transmission in this car, we had two specs of it. For 1976, we had the Hewland FG400 in its five-speed specification, so that's what we would have here. For 1977, it was a six-speed gearbox, and uh, that was still a Hewland gearbox, but one more forward ratio in it. That was actually a sequential manual for 1977, with the ZF differential going out the back. The weight in 1976 was 595 kilograms or 1,312 pounds. For 1977, significantly heavier, 620 kilograms or 1,370 pounds. Fuel, as the sponsors may belie, was provided by ELF. And the tires, those bespoke front tires, were produced by Goodyear in the era. Nowadays, you still see a couple P34s running around the world. They're both in their 1977 spec, I believe. They run Avon tires. They're the only company on the planet, I believe, that is still manufacturing a front tire small enough to run on the P34. Competition history on this car. It was only run by Terrell in 1976 and 1977. It was driven by Jody Schechter, Patrick Depaillet, and Ronnie Peterson. The car made its debut at the 1976 Spanish Grand Prix. And over 30 races run, it won one of them, took pole position in one of them, and took fastest lap in three of them. The competition history not so illustrious. It scored no Constructors' Championships and no Drivers' Championships. That 1976 Swedish Grand Prix, this car's one and only triumph, it proved that a six-wheeler car could work, and of course, only two years later, at the 1978 Swedish Grand Prix, with the Brabham BT46B fan car, that Grand Prix was also won, again, by a very experimental Formula One car. So there's something to do with Sweden and radical cars, and perhaps if we got a Swedish Grand Prix back on the calendar, we would have, I don't know, a nuclear-powered something <laughs> win that race. So come on, Sweden, get back on the calendar. But yes, that is, in very layman's terms, the rationale and the competition history of the Terrell P34. Now let's take a little bit closer look at what's going on under the skin. As the car spins around in front of us here, just taking a look at the overall configuration and overall proportions of this. Aside from it having six wheels, there's nothing here that's too radical in terms of the context of the time in which it was racing and the time in which it was designed. We don't have a whole lot of sculpted bodywork. We don't have shrink-wrapped body panels over engines and things like that. It looks almost nothing like a modern Formula One car or modern open-wheeled car in general. Everything's exposed here. The engine is exposed. There is no engine cover at all. There is no air intake snorkel on this particular specification of the car. There would have been one later on in 1976, but uh, that would have been removed again for the 1977 car. But also, we have radiators just stuck onto the sides of what I suppose you could call side pods, but they're not really side pods in the sense that we would call them today. There are certain things on the car that almost appear to be afterthoughts in that regard. In addition to the principal engine radiators on the back there, on that strut supporting the rear wing, there's another radiator that would appear to be a gearbox oil cooler radiator there. Other than that, there are all sorts of wires and hoses and air ducts and things just stuck wherever they would fit. So certainly in terms of being a very well-polished design in the sense of what you would see on a modern formula car, doesn't at all look like anything that you would see on a racetrack here in 2019. But this is what they were in the era, and of course, it's what the technology allowed. Aerodynamics, yes, very important in the macrocosmic design, uh, rationale of a car like this, and that's the reason why they went for four front wheels in the first place, but fine-tuning things like that was still more or less an unknown. Of course, at around the same time as this, we would start to see teams playing with ground effect, and in particular with the skirts coming down from the flanks of the car and sealing the under tray with the ground. We don't see that at all here on the P34, but 
Lotus was starting to experiment with this, and of course the Lotus 79 for the 1978 season, which won the championship. That was a ground effect car, or what they called a wing car in that era, and that the entire car was a wing. And of course Brabham at the same time playing with active ground effect with their fan car design, but also using sliding skirts to seal the under tray and provide more suck effect underneath to bring the car down low onto the ground at speed. The Lotus 79, of course, generating a lot of downforce that way. The BT46B generating a lot of downforce at a standstill via the active fan driven off the gearbox. But that was the idea back in this era. It was experimentation, like we said off the top, and this was one avenue that teams went down. Terrell, of course, the only team to race a six-wheeled car, but March also came up with a six-wheeler, and Ferrari also came up with a six-wheeler. Williams as well testing a six-wheeled car, but Terrell, the only team actually to race one. Now, taking a look at what's going on with this car for the sake of being the model that it is. This one is somewhat of an older one in the collection. I got this model in 2012 and at that time you'll actually uh, see a video up on my channel about this car in the, uh, the older format that I initially did these reviews with. Um, just a slideshow and uh, some narration there, but I think it's definitely worthy of a second look now that we've got some better cameras and some better ways to show you everything that's going on. It's by True Scale Miniatures in 118 scale. This was actually the first TSM car that I got. So at the time it was a bit of a shot in the dark, but definitely very pleased with ultimately what I found upon arrival. There are so many features on this model that it's going to take quite some time to show them all to you. But the long and short of it is, all the bodywork is removable, so that is the area around the cockpit that you see there. The rear wing is removable, and all six wheels are removable. They're secured by their own very tiny, minuscule wheel nuts, which uh, are removed courtesy of this very, very small wrench that you see coming in, emblazoned with the Terrell logo. So. Yeah, it's a very hands-on sort of model, and it's going to take some time to show it all to you, but let's get on with all of that. First off, let's just take a little bit of a closer look at the car as it is fully assembled here. Uh, yep, there is the front wing, I suppose we might be able to very loosely call it. It's really a snowplow, <laughs> if you want to think of it that way. But, uh, yep, we do have a little bit of a front splitter there, and it's secured with its own little clips. Of course, that would all be removable in the pits so that they could do setup work and make any repairs, things like that. Two NACA ducts along the front wing as well. Those are feeding the brake ducts, which are not at all like the brake ducts that you'd see on a modern car. They're actually just hoses that go back and blow air into the wheel hubs here. And we'll take a closer look at that later on. But uh, the front end on this car, there we go. Wheels are one, three three and then two and four on the right hand side and you can see the detail inside the wheels there. Uh, we do have brake discs and calipers inside all four front wheels and uh, getting a little bit close here on the focus but you can just see we do have the brake disc and the calipers in there and there you go the Goodyear lettering on the tires, the uh, wheels and even the valve stems for changing the tire pressures. Very cool. Below that and underneath, you can see some of the plumbing for the brake system and some of the suspension. Of course, we'll see all of that in more detail when we take the wheels off. Getting up into the cockpit area, unlike on a modern car, the driver sits on top of this car rather than inside it. And uh, if we go above, you can start to see the overall idea of what's going on in here. There's your cockpit, there's your steering wheel, and believe it or not, there's your gear lever. Yep, manual gearbox in this era on all the cars. Seat belt detail and all of that stuff going on, and of course, you'll get a much closer look at that later. Midsection of the car, there's your side pods and fuel tanks in there, actually, and then uh, your radiators there along the rearmost section of the side pod. And then we start to get into the rear zone of the car with the engine. There's the DFV. There are your intake trumpets there, one per cylinder on this V8 engine. Then your spark plug lines going into the distributor back there. Then the rear axle, your gearbox, the differential, and then you've got your inboard mounted brake discs inside there. Again, trying to minimize unsprung weight. Brake ducts for cooling those rear brakes. There they are, just forward and above. Nice idea there. Then the anti-roll bar 
and then your linkages for the rear suspension going up toward the midsection of the car to the back of the monocoque. So cool. Uh, I suppose you could call the engine a semi-stressed member in this construction because there is a little bit of a subframe back here that is mostly composed of suspension. Below that and just the rear of the engine you can see the struts and the coil springs in there over those struts. Very nice, one on each side of course. Then the extreme rear of the car. Here's your gearbox casing oil cooler for the gearbox, and then your rear wing, of course, and its two support struts back there, all in aluminum, as you would expect. Rear wheels, much larger than the front wheels, of course, but there they are. There's a wheel nut inside and the valve stem for your tire pressure adjustment. Very, very, very nice. Now, <laughs> let's start to take this thing apart piece by piece and uh, take a closer look at what's going on underneath. First off, the easy stuff. The bodywork around the cockpit, this just lifts off, it all sits in its uh, own little peg areas there. You can see the pegs down there, four of them down there on the lower side of the bodywork. And then uh, inside you have your mirrors integrated with all of that, and then you have got these two little windows inside. And uh, the reason why these windows were put in, initially they were not on the car, they were put there uh, by the request of the drivers because the drivers wanted to be able to see the front tires because they're very small and uh, obviously they wouldn't be able to see them from the cockpit so because they would wear very quickly because of their size they wanted just to be able to glance down and see the state of those front tires so the windows were added there of course this is completely non-structural so putting a hole in there and putting some perspex or whatever it is in there didn't really affect anything too dramatically with all that removed now you can see the real structure of the car this is it. There is no protection at all around where the driver is. That fairing around the cockpit is really there just for an aerodynamic purpose as well as to give the driver a little bit of a false sense of security as he's going around there. But taking a look at this, uh, you can now see that we do have some very nice detail going on. Here's our steering column. There is our joint there articulated for the steering which actually does work and uh, yeah, it's uh, very cool. When we take the uh, wheels off, it's easier to turn the wheels with the steering wheel. But the steering does actually work on this car. And uh, yeah, it's very, very, very nice. And uh, of course, we'll take a closer look at that once we take the wheels off because uh, there's a little bit too much grip right now just to uh, turn the steering by itself. But there it is. It is all fully articulated. And then some more uh, detail now. The driver's seat with the seat belts and all of that. The uh, rear section of the uh, bodywork around the cockpit, also removable, just like the front section. It just uh, lifts up with a little bit of persuasion, and there it is. It's all die cast, and uh, yeah, there it is with our sponsor logos, Jody Schechter's name, and uh, British flag, interestingly. I believe he was racing under a UK license at the time, even though Jody Schechter, of course, is from South Africa. Down here, just the underside of that, no detail at all, just the overall structure of the piece, but very nice, and a little bit of a driver's headrest detail as well. So there is the uh, bodywork from around the cockpit removed, and uh, the rear wing also is removable. Rear wing just sits on top of the uh, pylons like this, it just lifts off, and there is the rear wing. Again, it's just a plastic piece, but you got uh, crisp uh, sponsorship graphics there. There's your elf, and then the other side there. Goodyear on the flap, and then Goodyear on the end fences there on each side. So that's cool. The underside there are the slots where it just sits on top of the pylons. So there you go. Rear wing removable, and uh, now you see the overall proportions of the rear end with the rear wing removed. And again, it just makes it a little bit easier for you to see what's going on in the rear zone of the car with the wing removed and out of the way. A little bit of a closer look now at the rear zone. Now it's a little bit more uncluttered without the wing there. And uh, yeah, you can see everything that's going on underneath here. There's your oil cooler for the gearbox. Another one down lower. The rain light, and then uh, down low, the back of the gearbox casing, the engine uh, exhaust there, the two terminal pipes out the back, and before that, of course, the, the collector pipes from the primaries. Top of the rear wing support, and then the engine itself, the top side of the engine anyway, there's your distributor in the middle of the block, and uh, this silver rectangular box that you can see, that would be the beginnings of a computer controlled unit. Uh, probably just some, by our standards, rudimentary electronics in there just to monitor everything in terms of ignition timing and uh, perhaps um, fuel injection as well. 
There you go. The intake trumpets up top there, replete with their metal mesh over top. And then the fuel lines going in to each cylinder. Very nice to see all of that detail. Of course, as we mentioned before, there are your spark plug uh, wires going in to the spark plugs going through the heads. Very nice. Very, very nice. Down low. It gets a little bit cluttered there just because there's a lot of stuff going on with the suspension. But there are your brake discs inside and the calipers over top of them. These actually do rotate, so the discs rotate through the calipers. And yeah, very cool. Over here on the right hand side you can see that red ring. That is a kill switch for the marshals or the driver if they stop on track and for some reason they can't shut the engine down. So that'll physically uh, close off the fuel system and starve the engine. So yes, that is what's going on in the rear zone. But by far the most impressive feature of this model for me is the fact that all six wheels come off. So we'll show you how all of that works. A little bit finicky. All right, so the process of removing the wheels takes a little bit of time, but it does happen. So here's our wrench, as we saw before, and uh, quite uh, literally, it just goes inside the wheels and uh, you take them off. We'll uh, start with the rears there. So it just goes into the center, like so, engages on it, and then you turn it left to start loosening things. And then before too long, the wheel nut comes out. Wheel nut is now inside there. Probably can't see it, but there it is. There's the wheel nut. Then you just pull the wheel off, like so. So there is one, and these wheel nuts are incredibly, incredibly small. Just uh, maybe one and a half millimeters across. So stick that inside the wheel there, just so you don't lose it. The other side, of course, same situation. Wrench goes in, engages, and then we turn it, loosen it up, and then off it comes. There it is. Again, keep everything as safe as we can. There are spare wheel nuts that come with the model, but there are only four of them, so if you happen to lose all of the wheel nuts, you cannot put the car back together. Good luck finding a little nut that is that size and will engage with those threads. Now for the front wheels, same situation. This goes over top. Nut comes off. The wheels come off like so that. Almost. There we go. Got that there. Wheel comes off. We can keep everything together. And then finally on the left side. Almost. There we go. It's off. Pull the wheel free. And then the final wheel. There we go. All right, so now the car is fully disassembled. We've got all six wheels demounted. And now we can get a sense of what it actually looks like. It's, uh, it's a really cool uh, proportion that you get, of course. Now, uh, the car would only ever look like this in the pits, and uh, it would be up on high stands, undoubtedly. But uh, there you go, and uh, that is what we're talking about here. And now we can see so much more in terms of the overall detail that we have flying around with this thing. There's your front end now totally exposed, and you can see the brake discs and the calipers now. Um, interesting to note that the calipers are mounted forward on the front axle, and then the second front axle, they're mounted rearward, so that's cool. There is your binnacle there for the steering wheel. 
the steering column inside the instrument panel, the wiring for the instrument panel, pedals are down there as well. It's absolutely phenomenal to see all this. Roll bar, cockpit area, there's your engine, rear wing support pylons, there's your rear zone now. You can see how the wishbones are going through uh, to the struts back there. So much stuff going on on this. Let's take a closer look. Here we are, there's the front end, and there are the uh, stub axles, wheel hubs, the brake discs there. There's your front suspension arrangement there, your pivot points for the steering. Here are the hoses, at least one of them, for the brake cooling, and you can see there's even a hose clamp there uh, securing it behind that NACA duct on the front wing. There is the pedal box, throttle and brake on the right there, and then the clutch on the other side of the steering column. So that means some interesting things if you're uh, going to be driving this. Right foot braking exclusively. There might be enough room for heel and toe there, but uh, you're not going to be doing anything else fancier in this car. Moving back, there is the cockpit. There's your cockpit instrumentation. If we can get a better angle on that, it's not quite looking so likely. But there it is, as you can see. Tachometer front and center ignition and a uh, little fire bottle in there most likely as well there's your gear lever very cool five-speed box remember and uh, generally that's what you've got in the cockpit and you can just see now quite dramatically how the driver sits on top of the car rather than inside it he is really not surrounded by anything and um, there is even a video of the 1976 spec of this car running around Monaco in the hands of Patrick Depaille and you'll see that he's actually not running this bodywork at all so the cockpit is all open in that video and uh, because they mounted the camera on top of the roll bar there angled down looking over top of the driver you can see everything that he is doing with the gearbox and with the pedal work and everything it's really cool and uh, I venture to say we'll never see anything quite like that again in Formula One with the driver being this exposed but there it was, and this is just how things worked back then. More detail here with all of the wiring coming back from the switches, and you can even see that there is a little bit of braided wire securing all of that. That's really cool, and that's actually um, a structural detail on the model. Very nice to see TSM doing something like that. Toward the midsection of the car, here are your lines uh, for the ignition control from the cockpit, throttle cable, um, hydraulic lines uh, going back to the rear brakes and then over top of the engine again as we saw there it is nice uh, bolts there holding the valve covers over the camshafts there spark plugs and spark plug leads going into the, the distributor back there brake lines all sorts of stuff all sorts of plumbing everywhere you look there are cables wires tubes whatever and uh, that was just the nature of the business back then and down here, unless I'm very much mistaken, you see this little cylindrical component with the red wiring coming to it that actually looks to be a starter. Did this car have an onboard starter? It well may have done, and uh, that looks like a starter to me. I'd have to do a little bit more research on that, but uh, I think that actually is a starter. Very cool. Rain light again. Pylons for the rear wing. Very nice. Very, very nice. There's a stub axle on the rear end. And you can see this uh, little bezel area, this little cutout area, that is actually where the rear wheels link up. So you get a hard mount there, and then your stub axle there with the threads. So very cool. And you do not want to cross-thread those very tiny wheel nuts. Coming back to the front end, here's where we can see that the steering will actually work. You just grab onto it, and then with any little bit of persuasion there we go you can see that we have got ourselves some steering action going on with this car it's, uh, it's a little bit finicky it does not really seem to want to turn in the other direction right now but uh, yeah you can see that the steering does actually work and it's uh, it's a really cool piece very 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 nice very cool to see all of that and uh, it's a little bit locked up right now in terms of what the steering rack does or does not want to do but it's all there and uh, you can see the articulations there if I can get my uh, camera around the side yeah, you can see how everything is articulated through the steering column 
So very, very cool to see all of that. And again, they really went to town on this model in terms of the details that they made visible to us. And of course, the ability to take a whole thing apart is really unique. And there are not too many model cars that allow you to do things like this, particularly at the price point that this one was. Typically, um, you'll see CMC and Exoto models have completely removable bodywork and removable wheels and things like that. Some of those models can go for many thousands, but not this one. This was 250 or so, I think, in 2011, 2012 dollars. So perhaps a little bit higher price now, uh, accounting for inflation, but still very nice and very well bought. And TSM were still a reasonably new company at this time. So very nice job by um, a company that were then a whole bunch of newbies at this. On the other detail, I want to show the underside of the car. Here we go. You can see the weight saving there, just having milled out some holes in the aluminum subframe there. Trying to save weight. Here is the information about the model itself. True scale miniatures, assembled in China. This is number 163 of 3000. So there you go. There's the provenance for you underneath. Underneath the engine there, the crankcase. Then out the back, the gearbox. You can see the subframe that everything's mounted to back here. Very cool. Very, very cool amounts of detail. All of this is metal down here as well. Very, very nice. Very nice indeed. And of course through here you can see the tubing supplying the air to the brakes to cool them. Very cool. And then you've got yourself the stub axle there and the brake discs from another angle. So lots of detail going on with this model even underneath and it looks very, very nice. Now the process of putting it all back together, it's uh, the same as uh, taking it apart, but it all happens in reverse and it takes a little bit longer because it just does. So uh, we'll start with the front wheels first. So we just line up our uh, stub axle with the center of the wheel, which is a little bit finicky to accomplish at times. There we go. So that's in place. We now get our very minuscule wheel nut and we get it inside the wrench trying to make sure it sits flat in there so it engages properly so this takes a couple of attempts there we go the wrench will then go on to the stub axle and now very carefully we turn it to the right just trying not to uh, cross thread anything if you feel any resistance before you should stop immediately so there we go, that is mounted and is tight. Same on the other wheel here on this side, of course. Get all of that mounted up. There we go. Oops. That's part of the problem, the wheel nut just hit the floor, and now I've got to find it. Where did it go? I think it went under my chair. One moment. Yes, we found it. So, <laughs> same as before. Get it inside there. All right, that's good. Get it onto the stub axle if we can. Here we go. All lined up. And just start to rotate. And being careful not to cross thread it. And there it is. Other side is much the same. Yeah, wheel mounted. There we go. That's on. All right. Lined up and uh, start to rotate. And it's tight. Right through there. It's getting there. Getting there. We'll uh, get our uh, steering straightened up as much as we can. There we go. There we are. Right. Not quite. 
white. There we are. So all four front wheels are now on. We'll just uh, check that uh, we've got good tension. And that's good. Now the rears, much the same as the fronts. They're a little bit easier than the fronts though. So line them up. Rotate it so that it sits back down there on the hub, which it has done. And then much like the rears, you can get on. <laughs> yep, you can see it's uh, very finicky sometimes with the uh, wheel nuts. Let's try this way. Will it actually stick inside? No. Okay. There we are. Good. Sometimes you got to be quick about it. Now, because it's so hard to see the stub axle on the rear, there's a little bit of guesswork. But it goes in just the same, and then it locks down. And now finally the last one. There we go. Rotate. All right, that's now sitting now on the hub. And we're going to do this again, aren't we? There we are. Get in there. And as you get more wheels on the car, it becomes easier to mount the, the wheels because you have the tires there actually giving you a little bit of grip. So that now looks good to me. Rear axle is spinning now. So the nuts are doing their job. Get the tension. And that's it. Wheels are back on. We can get the rear wing back on at this point. Just sits on there. Doesn't really secure very well, but there it is. And then our bodywork front section, well, the rear section rather, it actually goes the other way around. I knew that. That interface is like so. There we go, and you can see that there actually is a bit of suspension movement in the car. And finally, the front section. That just goes on like so. So there it is. There is your reassembled Tyrrell P34 uh, with all of that process. Uh, you know, roughly 10 minutes it takes to uh, take it apart and put it back together. But there it is, and uh, the ability to be able to do that on a model car is something that I think is very cool, and it's something that's still rather unique in the overall hobby. So if you've got a model that has removable parts like this, definitely take care of it because it's got some really good display value. And again, I like these more hands-on models as well because they really make you feel like you're learning something. So very, very nice to see all of that stuff. So there you have it, the 1976 Terrell P34 in 1 scale by True Scale Miniatures. It's an older model of mine. It's one that you've seen before, but it is one that people do ask me about from time to time. So again, I thought it was appropriate to give you all a second look at this absolutely wonderful car. As you can see, it's absolutely bristling with detail inside and out. And because of the era of car that this is and the way it's designed, so much of that detail is just in plain sight at all times. But when you take the bodywork off, when you take all six wheels off, it really does pop with all sorts of little intricacies that are not immediately apparent. So really, it is so very cool to take a look at a car like this. And I hope that this wasn't too lengthy with uh, taking things apart and putting them back together. But I just wanted to show you just how finicky it can be at times. Yes, do be very careful not to lose those little wheel nuts. And of course, um, this is actually pretty early on in the production run of these as well. They made 3,000 in total. This is number 163 of 3,000. So it's in the first 200 cars made. So an early production version, and it's still absolutely perfect inside and out. 
really there are no criticisms at all that I would levy in its general direction. If you are in the market for one of these, they are still available. I don't know if TSM are still selling these directly, but I do know that they are available in private sales on eBay and other places as well. So if you really do want one, you can still get one. All the prices have climbed a little bit since they did first hit the market some nine, eight years ago now. So do keep your eyes peeled if you want one of these. In terms of the subject matter, well, I don't think it really needs any justification for its existence at all. It's a six-wheeled Formula One car, and it's the only one of which ever to win a Grand Prix. So certainly it's worthy of being reproduced in such high fidelity as this. And definitely it's one that I'm glad to have in the collection because it is a little bit of an oddity, but also there's so much to learn here when you look at the history of Formula One design. You're going to see this car, and if you can get your hands on something that represents it pretty nicely as this model does, definitely it's going to stick in your mind, and you're going to learn something pretty cool about vehicle dynamics and car design and engineering in general. So I do hope that you all very much enjoyed this one. 8802 Gator specifically has been the uh, channel proprietor who's been requesting that I take another look at this car for quite some time. So here it is. I hope that it met all of your expectations, even though I'm pretty sure that there will be some heckling at the end of this video in the comments section telling me what a terrible job I did. It's all in good fun, and I appreciate the heckles. Until next time, I do thank you all very much for watching Ferrari Man 601 saying thank you, and of course, we will see you soon.